meeting is because we are starting the recording and the streaming and uh, we might need some uh, authorization. Se, so, se alguém cair da reunião, por favor, volte. É porque a gente iniciou a gravação e o streaming. So, Professor Bruno, thank you. <laughs> Miriam, uh, thank you very much. It is really a great honor for the Carlos Chagas Filho Institute of Biophysics of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro to host the first symposium on cell biology, microscopy, and parasitology in celebration of its 75th anniversary. No one better to open this symposium than Dr. Bruce Alberts, former president of the National Academy of Science, editor of science, and one of the authors of The Molecular Biology of the Cell, a book that every undergraduate or graduate cell biology student, past or present, affectionately calls The Cell. A book that includes most of what is known about the cells as intricate and interactive collection of chemical reactions and macromolecules that function as protein machines, but also draw attention to what is not known and should be the focus of future research. This endless pursuit to understand what is not known is what drives the human research efforts and is in the very core of the Institute of Biophysics since its creation in 1945. Throughout the 16 talks that compose this symposium, we will hear from the foremost specialists in cell biology, microscopy and parasitology with outstanding contributions to understand nature in their respective fields. After having a brief glimpse of the sunrise in California, I declare the symposium officially open and I will give the floor to Professor Susana Frases Carvajal, our graduate program in biophysics coordinator to um, um, introduce this uh, symposium and then uh, uh, to uh, uh, prof uh, Professor van der Leyde Souza that will introduce our uh, most distinguished guest today. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant uh, uh, conference today. Bye. Dear Professor Alves, thank you very much for your presence today. It's an honor for the graduate program in biophysics to have you as a speaker in a discipline of our program. For our students and for ourselves, it's a privilege to listen to you today. Please, uh, we want to you to make use of yourself at home and be very, very welcome. Thank you very much and Thank have you. a great talk. Thank you. <laughs> Professor van der Leek, please, can you introduce Dr. Alves? Okay, are you hearing me? It's working. Yes, please go ahead, Professor. Hello. Hello. I would like to start this presentation with a photo. Are you seeing the photo? Follow the delay. <laughs> okay. Estou ouvindo? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see the picture. Sim. Professor. Hello? We hear you and we can see the photo. Yes, okay. I, I would like to start with this photo that was taken two years ago. Visit us during the International Congress of Cell Biology. So that this photo is uh, here in several places to show his presence here. I think that Bruce doesn't need any introduction to Bruce no. Diaz told about the and I would add Essential Cell Biology that is also a second book a short one but is also very well known by our students. But I would like to 
uh, make a few comments to say that Bruce Albert did his uh, basic formation, undergraduation and formation at Harvard University, then the postdoc at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and then at the University of Cambridge in, in UK. He started his career as professor, associate assistant and associate professor in principal, and then moved to San Francisco, where he was head of the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, University of California, uh, San Francisco. But he is honorary professor or more of more than 20 universities throughout the world, including our university. A few years ago, he received here the title of honorary professor of Rio de Janeiro Federal University. Mm -hmm. He is a member of the USA National Academy of Science and the more than 20 other academies, the most of the academies in the world, include the two arts, the Academy of Science and the Brazilian Academy of, of Science. He has a very active participation in most of the foundations in the United States that in some way support research activity not only in the United States, but also countries, uh, including Brazil. He was president of the National Academy of Science of USA and editor in chief of science for, for seven years. He is commander of the Order of the British Empire. And Sometimes he was advisor, scientific advisor of the president Barack Obama of the United States, and we hope that we will be advisor of the next president of the United States. That is uh, what uh, we, we expect, of Bruce. So that with this few I like that he is a friend of Brazil. He is a friend of Indonesia. He, he went several times to Indonesia to in some way a device size and technology development and in Indonesia. Unfortunately, this is a internet presentation, but I hope Bruce, that you can come to Brazil next because the university, State University of Amazonas, also wants to give you the title of honorary professor of that university, and certainly many people from that university are now today. I will finish saying that at this moment, we have more than 1,000 people here in you, so that this is a really a very huge number of participants of the Congress, and the problem have a big problem if everyone wants to ask questions to Bruce at the end of, mm -hmm. of the conference. Please, Bruce, please <laughs> can you start your talk. Okay, thank and you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wanderly. It's, I'm very sorry I'm not there because I've enjoyed all my trips to Brazil, especially uh, I think Brazil has the most enthusiastic students about cell biology and you know cell, bi cell biology uh, really gets a lot of appreciation from brazilian students i don't understand it but it's it's really wonderful how uh they enjoy uh learning about themselves and how they all the molecules that make us work uh, so I, i'm going to let's see i have to get my i have to get my screen to work <laughs> one second <laughs> Uh, okay. Can you see my slides now? Yes, yes, we can see them. Okay, this is okay. So I, I've been asked to sort of give a broad introduction to this whole workshop 
uh, which is focused on uh, microbiology and parasitology. I'm not going to talk about those subjects. I'm going to talk much more broadly about cell biology. Of course, cells are fundamental to everything in life. And everything I say will be highly relevant to every organism that, that's going to be discussed uh, later. Um, and uh, I, I just want to start with by showing a little outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my talk is in three parts. Uh, I, I want to stress how much we don't know yet about even the simplest living cells, uh, because this is critical for students to recognize that there's all this wonderful uh, work for them to do. We need them to solve these uh, mysteries. Uh, when you write a textbook, of course, you talk about what's known and you often don't make it clear to students that there's only maybe 10% known about what we need to understand about cells. Uh, and then and secondly, I want to talk about a particular kind of uh, research that tends to be underappreciated these days. Uh, fundamental biological research, which is over the long term going to be responsible for improving human w health and welfare, but uh, that's not obvious to most people, including people in our government, uh, many people in our government who just want you to solve their particular problem now. So we have to invest in the future. And thirdly, I can never give a talk without talking a little bit about science and science education and, and, and how we have to all work uh, to spread science more actively across the world. So this is the first part. <laughs> I've been wa working on writing a textbook of cell biology, as was mentioned, but it's, it's now 42 years. Uh, I'm now working on the seventh edition of Molecular Biology of the Cell. I'm just taking a break from a, my chapter right now by giving this talk. So this is a little bit crazy to, but 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 uh, <clears throat> I did learn a lot. I am learning a lot. Uh, what's really encouraging is uh, even in this edition, I'm learning a lot. So I have, I'm still a student in many ways. Uh, so here's that, how it all started. This is uh, a picture of the famous Jim Watson when he was 25 years old. Um, 25 years later, in 1978, I got a sudden phone call, and he asked me to join him and two others as an author of a new textbook that he envisioned would be important. Dr. Yes? Alves? I'm sorry, I apologize for interrupting you. Uh, I don't think most of us, if any of us, can actually see your presentation the second time after Vandele showed his, your picture. So um, I don't know if Miriam can help us. Or otherwise, could you uh, start the presentation again? Uh, are you seeing my slides or not? Uh, apparently, I'm not able, and other people are also okay, mentioning I'm, that they are right, not I'm, able I'm, to see this. All right, that's what happened last time. So I'm going to stop sharing and start again. <laughs> I apologize for that. No. I I mean, this is what happened last time. I don't know what's going on. My, yeah. I'm stopping. I was asked to interrupt you. I'm, I apologize for that. Okay, no, no. Please let me know when this happens. So now I have to. Let's see. This is what. Ha that's what I afraid would would happen. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna not. You can see me. Can you see me? Uh, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I, we can see you. I apologize okay, okay. for interrupting you. Oh, I have several I'm... people mentioning that. Other people saying that they could oh, see okay, you. Okay. Okay. All right. So I okay. don't know. All right. Now I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try start sharing my screen again. Uh, it's frustrating. Uh, okay, I think now it's loading. Yeah, we can we can see it now. Okay, this this may happen. This may happen repeatedly. Just keep interrupting me. It it may yeah, be. I apologize for that. No, no, no. It, no, it, it happened last time when I was giving a talk like this on Google Meet. I don't know what's going on. So just just okay, people. Are we could just keep doing this if we have to, I'm afraid. Okay, so this is uh, the slide that I was talking about. Uh, uh, I got the sudden in invitation to, to, to uh, participate in a new 
textbook that Jim Watson thought would be very important to, to, because he said it was time to unite two fields, uh, molecular biology, which came out of uh, chemistry and genetics, and that was what I was working on. Another field that was much older called cell biology that came out of microscopy, light microscopy in the 19th century, and electron microscopy also in uh, later. And, and uh, so he thought it was time to bring all these, these two different fields together. There were separate textbooks on molecular biology and cell biology. And uh, he was right. But of course, anything new is very difficult. Uh, Jim Watson said it would take us only two months because, you know, he, he's very uh, optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it actually took us more than a year of 12-hour days. All the authors sat together in rooms. It was uh, very hard uh, to produce this book, and uh, we almost quit several times. But finally, we learned how to do it. This is just a picture of the first set of authors uh, crossing Abbey Road with the Beatles. Uh, and uh, th this was... Uh, done because we were working in London. Most of the authors were in London, and we, we I would go there to work with them, and we were working very close to the famous Abbey Road recording studio. Uh, so this is the uh, last edition, sixth edition, and uh, I just want to emphasize that each time we write a new edition, we're humbled by how much we still don't know. Of course, we're impressed by how much new we've learned in the last five years or so, but uh, it, it's still uh, huge gaps remain in our knowledge. So, so here's how we viewed the cell when I started graduate school a long time ago, 1961. Uh, so I was working in a physical chemist lab, Paul Doty, and we were very impressed by the enormous collision rate of molecules. Uh, and we therefore thought of the cell as a tiny test tube composed of an enormously concentrated mixture of disorganized individual uh, proteins and RNA molecules that were free freely diffusing around and colliding randomly. That is, uh, there was no need for internal organization in a living cell. Of course, we now know that this is all wrong. And an early discovery was the importance of so-called protein machines. And we now know that every process basically is now driven by a complex of 10 or more proteins. And these proteins work much like a machine, like a machine that you know about that from our, our normal lives that are usually driven by electric energy and uh, very central to any machine is coordinated ordered movements that are driven by energy in one direction. And in the cell, they're mostly driven by the energy of ATP or GTP hydrolysis, uh, which causes an allosteric directional change in a protein conformation. So I'm gonna to try to see if this movie works <laughs> because this is a, my favorite movie. <laughs> I personally worked on the mechanism, the mystery at that time of DNA replication. When I started working on DNA replication in 1961, nobody had any idea how it worked. Uh, we knew only one enzyme, DNA polymerase, and uh, there were all kinds of crazy ideas, including one of mine that I worked on for five years on my thesis that wasn't very successful, uh, trying to think about how one enzyme could copy all of DNA and uh, anyway, after 30 years of working on it, uh, this is the kind of mechanism we came up with. And this is the protein machine that replicates DNA. DNA, of course, has two strands, and they run in opposite directions. So one strand has to be uh, synthesized backwards. Only one strand, the so-called leading strand, could be made continuously in the the one strand that's copied backwards has to be made in a short uh, series of short fragments called Okazaki fragments. And if anybody had, uh, when I was a graduate student, proposed a theory that this is how DNA was replicated, they would have been totally thought to be crazy. I mean, uh, this had to be discovered by uh, 
by by experiments and it and to us at that time it would have seemed impossible too complicated to work but of course proteins machines make it work but the reason why i'm showing this slide uh is really because this is how all of life works um but catalyzed by different kinds of machines let's see if this works <clears throat> Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called a helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. So, uh, you still seeing the slides? Uh, th th this, this is a, a, a recent breakthrough um, from the UK, basically um, working out the eukaryotic DNA replication uh, machinery in complete detail, including the initiation process. And that took 42 different polypeptides to make this system work in a, in a, in a, in a test tube. This system now replicates a chromatin with nucleosomes on it. it and it's quite a uh, important achievement. And this is the, summary of what uh, this laboratory has reconstructed with this 42 different uh, or whatever numbers different peptides uh, and i just want to emphasize uh, that this is only about a tenth of the proteins critical to dna replication and dna repair most of those other reactions we can't reconstruct uh, the machinery in the same kind of detail and there's a lot of work still to be done but this is the kind of uh, nature of, of, of life that it, 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 it just operates on all these incredibly complicated chemical reactions. Uh, life is the most com complicated chemistry known. Uh, and this is why we need a lot of research to figure it out. So understanding the molecular details of these DNA replication and DNA repair pathways will be critical to improving human health, uh, even though it's not directly uh, dealing with issues of human health. This is one example, cancer, uh, the so-called uh, phenomenon of tumor progression, how, which is how a cancer develops. It selects for hypermutability uh, because you have to accumulate five to 10 different mutations in a single line of cells in order to escape from the normal growth controls and make a dangerous tumor. So different tumors will have by chance acquire a very different defect in, in one of these DNA repair or DNA replication pathways. There's probably 150 different ways you could do that. Uh, and there's a great potential in exploiting each particular defect to irradiate a cancer in so-called personalized medicine. But we need to know much more before we can do this effectively. Uh, the proof of the principle has been made in, in at least one case, the so-called PARP inhibitors that, that, that are very effective against particular kind of defects, the, like the BRCA1 defect in many breast cancers. But, but uh, they don't work on other tumors because that's not the cause of their instability. So that, that's just a, 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 the, this is a sense of, of where we have to head if we want to, if we really want to make medicine effective, we need to know much more about basic cell biology. So important challenge for the next generation of biochemists 
is obtaining the information needed to accurately describe the, the mechanism of every type of protein machine in a cell. And that there, there, there are many hundreds of proteins and machines in a cell, and each one has to be studied the same way that the DNA replication apparatus and others have been studied. Of course, a famous protein machine is the ribosome, which we know how that works in great detail. So there are many machines we know about, but most of them we don't have the kind of detail we need in order to do intelligent interventions. So I want to talk about two recent surprises for textbook authors about the sophistication that, that, uh, of, of the chemistry of cells. I mean, we'd, we'd never realized this. <laughs> Actually, writing a textbook every five years, you, you, know, it's, you really get to, to see how science is progressing. And it's, it's a great privilege, actually, to be able to take the time to, to do that. Uh, and so one of the things we were surprised about is the recognition of extensive sets of scaffolds, which are special protein and RNA molecules produced biochemical subcompartments in the cell without requiring a membrane. And that many, many of these scaffolds can assemble to create larger so-called phase separated liquid compartments. Uh, and the second surprise is uh, how complex networks of uh, interactions give rise to emergent properties that can't be predicted by human mind alone. And I'll talk about both of these. So scaffold proteins, this is a little diagram from our, our book, just to give you the general idea of what scaffold proteins do. They contain many flexible regions uh, interrupted by binding sites for reactants. The reactants are these colored molecules. And uh, by, by holding them in the close vicinity, they greatly speed up their rate of reaction with each other to create product. And, not only are these scaffold proteins um, uh, effective in speeding up biochemistry, but they are generally located in a specific place in the cell. So they, they make uh, separate compartments in different parts of the cell. Here's the simplest example I know of a scaffold, uh, uh, of a, a scaffold protein. One of the earliest I uh, came uh, across was a work from Tom Pollard's lab on actin polymerization Actin, of course, is a very fundamental uh, cytoskeletal uh, protein. It does many different things in this cell. It's a long protein filament that would go down through the, many, uh, through the floor in this diagram. And it grows at one end, and that growth is often catalyzed by a specific protein called formin. There are many different formins. And this is just one of them. This green thing is the formin. And the foramen uh, contains these whiskers or scaffolds, which bind little actin monomers and hold them close by so that the filament can grow faster than the normal quote, diffusion controlled rate, which would be the normal rate at which actin mon monomers would collide with the growing end. And that's how this scaffold was discovered because uh, <clears throat> you can't go you react faster than the collision rate, so something had to be speeding up the collision rate. So this is just a very simple example. Uh, RNA scaffolds very recently have also been widely uh, discovered. Uh, these are uh, long non-coding non RNAs called link RNAs. We don't really understand most of them, but it's clear that RNA scaffolds also are important. Uh, they're involved in, uh, scaffolds in general are involved in forming many different biochemical factories inside the cell. And this is just an old photograph of a cell nucleus uh, showing that transcription factories are red and replication factories are green. These are places where the ingredients needed, the many proteins needed to replicate DNA or to make RNA transcripts uh, those, they're concentrated there to speed the biochemistry and they form when you start replicating DNA or when you start making RNA and then they go away. So these are transient uh, compartments that make the biochemistry work effectively. <clears throat> so phase separated inter intracellular condensates are the basis for many different membranous organelles 
something we didn't appreciate uh, even uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and this is uh, some examples. The most famous one is the nucleolus, They're known as a, a, a separate body inside the nucleus that makes ribosomes and other things. It's, it's known since the 19th century because it's visible in the light microscope, but nobody had any idea how it was held together. And here's some other uh, examples, that, but there are many. So in conclusion, a cell is nothing like a test tube. Nearly everything is organized inside the cell by protein and RNA scaffolds. So the second thing I'll uh, surprise I, I will talk about, which much more briefly is so-called emergent properties. So here's how nearly all of biology works. When I was a student, we learned that A goes to B, goes to C, goes to D, goes to E, which is true. But that wouldn't work inside of a cell without all kinds of feed forward and feed backward mechanisms that control those reactions. And just even the a simple network like this uh, uh, is uh, too complicated for the human mind to, to grasp without mathematics. So we're, we're going to need uh, to, to, as biologists, need to incorporate computer science and mathematics into our, in, into our thinking much more deeply and if we're going to really understand how cells work. And here's a a simple example coming back to actin filament again. This is in, in a yeast cell. Uh, these are all the proteins that interact with actin to make it do different things. And some of them um, make it the actin filament move, like uh, the famous uh, myosin molecules. That's, those are the green ones. Uh, the filament dynamics, uh, like the formin molecule I showed you before, those are the dark purple ones. Uh, there are other, other molecules that, that, that have other functions, chopping up filaments, strengthening filaments, and so on. And of course, they can't all interact at the same time in the same place with actin. They, 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 they act in groups, and, and some groups exclude each other. We can't really uh, understand, even when we know everything about this uh, protein network, we can't make sense of it with the human mind. We need new technologies. Uh, obviously based on computer science and mathematics, to really come to grips to reach what I would call an understanding of what's going on. And this is true of so many other things in, in all of biology. For example, cell signaling networks uh, are very similarly uh, complicated and very hard to uh, come to understanding, even if you get all the different components uh, studied in great detail. So as a consequence of such complexity, even when we know everything, we will not be able to understand even the simplest of living cells. Instead, life re reflects what physicists originally described as emergent properties, emergent properties that result from very complex networks of interactions. So we need to be able to somehow come to grips with this and, and decipher this in addition to knowing the molecular biology. So my conclusion, I think it's going to take the rest of the century at least to gain a true understanding of how cells and organisms work. We need much more biochemistry and purified systems that reconstitute biological reactions. Uh, also, we're going to need new quantitative methods for analyzing and understanding the enormous complexity of life's chemistry. And I emphasize this is going to come from computer ma modeling, engineering, mathematics, and so on. And nobody really has come uh, close to really you know, developing the tools that we need to, to really come to this kind of understanding yet. But I'm confident we will. Some of you, uh, hopefully, in the audience. All right, the second part of my uh, talk is that fundamental biological research will be essential for improving human health, and uh, as well as for many other uh, uh, advan human advantages. And here's the current problem. I don't know about Brazil, but in the United States, the, United, the, the main funding, funder of biological research is the National Institutes of Health, so-called NIH. And uh, myself and many others feel that 
we've been overemphasizing so-called translational uh, biomedical research. Uh, translational biomedical research working on disease processes and so on is very important, but <clears throat> also critical. Uh, with so many unknowns and so little understanding, fundamental research on biological, biological mechanisms will be critical for over the longer run, making real breakthroughs in human health. So this is, I, I was editor in chief of Science Magazine for five years and I wrote, uh, I, I had to produce something like 250 editorials, one a week. <laughs> and this is my favorite one. Uh, I, I, most of them I recruited other people to write. I only wrote about 50. But this is Huda Zogby, a wonderful scientist from Baylor. Um, now, Huda was born in Lembadon, and so she speaks more than one language. And so only she could write this uh, editorial. First, first, of all, first of all, she started as an MD, was not a researcher. She was treating kids who had uh, something called Rett uh, syndrome, uh, uncurable disease of the brain. And she was so frustrated, she had no tools. She became a researcher and quite a successful researcher. So. She comes from a medical background, and she's a translational researcher, a very famous one. Uh, but but uh, here's what she says, you know, today many high qualified basic scientists feel compelled to jump on the translational medicine bandwagon, and she's complaining about the fact that she needs basic research to help her do her work. And she has this wonderful quote in this editorial, she says, the ch challenge in translational medicine is that scientists are trying to translate a text with the sophistication and depth of Shakespeare using a first grader's vocabulary and experience. I, I just thought that was such a wonderful way to think about uh, the importance of, uh, of getting fundamental understanding to help people like her do their uh, translational work. Uh, here's one example of what we don't know. Uh, this, this work uh, called Design and Synthesis of a Minimal Bacterial Genome, uh, the, finding out a microplasmal, a small bacterium genome back down to 473 genes that are, they call the minimal genome. Uh, that is, the, they, if they took out more genes, the, the, the little bacteria would uh, suffer a, a lot. It would it wouldn't replicate. It wouldn't copy itself every three hours. Uh, so that all these 473 genes were were needed for a, a reasonable bacterium to grow. <laughs> and uh, that's so. But the sounding thing is that they couldn't predict which genes would be essential. They started out by guessing, and that didn't work. And the reason why is when they got down to the minimal genome, 149 of the 473 genes were of unknown function, would not have been suspected of being essential. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that there's some Nobel Prizes hidden in working out what these 149 genes do. But very few people are working on it. It's not fashionable to, to work on these fundamental, very critical problems. Here's another example, the importance of the fruit fly, Drosophila. We're still far from understanding how cells work together to form and maintain tissues. And a great many examples show that first working on a mechanism in the fruit fly provides a shortcut to understanding humans. It turns out that we use the same mechanisms, but fruit flies are much more readily accessible for study. They have genetic, really great genetics and they're simpler than humans. They have a, a stripped down system, so you could first work it out there, then work on a more complicated human case. As an example, in our last edition, the chapter on the development of tissues contains 50 references to Dros Drosophila, four times more than the next most cited uh, organism, which is the mouse. Let's consider the human brain. This is the ultimate emergent property of human consciousness. You know, from a network of cellular connections, you get human consciousness. Incredibly difficult problem to work on. People are working on it. But uh, 
here's a little uh, section of our textbook which points out that the human brain contains more than 100 billion neurons, each of which on average has to make connections with a thousand other, thousand other neurons according to a regular and predictable wiring plan. So this is really an incredibly complicated uh, 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 biological problem to work out how the brain works. So the Drosophila fruit fly brain contains only about 100,000 neurons, a million times less than the humans. And we could really map all those uh, neurons so we know where each one is. And uh, we have all this genetics. You can knock out any gene you want. You can modify genes. All these tools you can't do in a human. So I would claim, I, I would, I'm sure that before, <laughs> Working on the, the Drosophila brain will be a great shortcut to understanding the human brain. But again, uh, you know, there's huge numbers of people, labs funded to work on the human brain, and relatively few labs funded to work on Drosophila brain. And to understand cells, we need new models, not only the old model organisms like fruit flies and uh, the worm C. elegans and so on, those are very important, but we also need new models. And I'm just giving credit to one of the prof young professors at UCSF, uh, Wallace Marshall, who, who basically uh, risked his career by jumping into a new area, trying to go back and work on the mystery of how a single cell knows where to put everything on its surface. The single cell is uh, called stentor, this particular one. It's a ciliate and uh, very familiar to many of the people in the audience in the department, but not familiar to most cell and molecular biologists. And it was a famous or organism worked on for many years by T.H. Morgan before he started to work on fruit flies, and then by a man by the name of Vance Tarter and, and others. And then it, nobody, started, nobody worked on it because they didn't have the tools. So Wallace came back now 50 years later with new tools like CRISPR and DNA sequencing and RNAi and all that. So he's trying to figure out how this thing works. And I'm quite sure that if we understood how the, this big signal cell knows how to, to position things on its surface, it has like a GPS system on its surface, uh, this will have very important uh, implications for understanding humans as well. So here's a new model organism. Unfortunately, uh, but uh, we, we, we are now obsessed with this virus, the coronavirus, which is, just to point out to students, this is an unusual virus. It's huge. It's more than four times larger than the flu virus, and it produces 29 proteins, most with functions we don't understand. This is uh, being worked on, of course, incredibly intense, intensively. It's become... Uh, you know, a, a huge uh, scientific, important scientific project, and it's going to bring great benefit to humanity to really understand how this organism works. In order to be a, a huge virus like this, you had the virus had to invent or acquire very special ways of replicating its genome because otherwise it would be too unstable. So that it wasn't easy to become a big virus. And there must be some really uh, selective, major selective advantage for this virus to be have so many proteins, but we have no idea what that what, what those are. And here's just uh, you know the 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 the, the fact the statement that you know this we're going to know so much about this virus, uh, and it's unprecedented to have so much work done on one single model, and it will lead to many new fundamental understandings of broad critical importance to the future of human health and our understanding of biology. And I'm just gonna give you one example. This is a project led from UCSF, but with a hundred, more than a hundred authors, uh, done really quickly by a huge cooperative effort, a new example for science, and maybe we can continue, we wanna continue this in the future. Uh, Nevin Krogan at UCSF is very articulate about how this style of research needs to be continued even after the epidemic. He, they purified each of the 29 proteins and used them as a, 
uh, bait to, to see what other human protein, what human proteins these each of the virus protein interacts with. And in this little summary from their paper, uh, the little red dot is a, one of the virus proteins, and the lines go to all the different human proteins that this vir these viral proteins, each one different, uh, interact with. And, and so the idea, of course, is to try to figure out uh, uh, you know, how this virus works. And to me, a striking uh, illustration of how little we understand about both how cells function and the immune system uh, is, is that we don't understand most of this. Uh, it seems that likely that many of these uh, coronavirus proteins have evolved to manipulate the immune system, and we don't. And, and these these these, these uh, proteins are going to be probes into helping us better understand how the immune system works. So there's many benefits from working on this model. Okay, so I just want to encourage students not to think that most problems are solved and there's not much for them to do. There's a huge uh, number of mysteries left. And uh, your job is, uh, if you want to do research, is to find an important mystery and solve it. And we need your energy and insights. And we need much more creativity and... and uh, risk-taking by young scientists. Uh, that's another topic I normally talk about, but not today. <laughs> so I just want to talk at the end about both science and science education being critical for all societies, because science is much more important for the world than most scientists think. I learned all about this. I had the privilege of being president of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States for 12 years, and I traveled all around the world and learned a lot about science. Here I am in a remote part of Kenya, uh, near Lake Victoria, with with subsistence farmers uh, and and some Kenyan scientists. The scientists are wearing ties, and the farmers are not. Uh, and seeing how uh, agricultural science had utterly transformed the lives of these uh, remote villages, and, and and allowed the villagers to. Uh, avoid the the months of, of near starvation they had every year uh, previous to this uh, in, in, in introduction of scientific agriculture. Uh, I when I was at uh, Science Magazine, I had the privilege of going to India many times, and we published a very important issue uh, with a picture of a Indian woman science on the cover, uh, Indian woman farmer on the cover. Uh, my final uh, uh, final um, issue called India Science for All. And it was amazing uh, how science and engineering was being applied to real, really helping the very poorest people in India. But science has also benefits beyond, uh, you know, improving health and improving agriculture and and all those things that we know about that have transformed our own lives. Each nation also needs much more of the creativity, rationality, openness, and tolerance that are inherent to science. What the Indian, India's first prime minister, Prime Minister Nehru called a scientific temper. Nehru said that his country needs science, and of course this has been a very important part of Indian development, in part for what it would bring science in, uh, bring to India in the way of development, but also because as a great democracy with 50 different languages and cultures uh, that you need tolerance and you need the scientific temper to make a democracy work. Uh, here, here are some values of science. Honesty, you have to be honest, otherwise science doesn't work. Uh, generosity, and a, very importantly, a strong demand for evidence with openness to all ideas and opinions irrespective of their so source. Uh, I often say that a graduate student will, may have a, a better idea than a Nobel Prize winner, and you had better pay attention. Uh, uh, authority doesn't really uh, work in science. It's, it's the ideas themselves. If you want to be innovative, you have to be open to all new ideas. And, and think of them uh, as independent of who originated them. 
So what do we mean by science? Uh, th this is really uh, something that I think we all recognize in this pandemic. I think both of our countries are failing to follow science. Uh, and we realize that our, 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 our society doesn't really understand how science works. And this, this uh, distinction that was made by a physicist that I really like, he pointed out it's critical to distinguish between the activity of scientists, which he calls lowercase science, science with a small s, and the product of that activity by denoting the product of the uh, activity as capital S, uppercase science. So in this view, capital S science emerges from small s science as collective public knowledge, universal and free of contradiction, only after being repeatedly tested by independent scientific investigations. And so scientific, science is really a, a vast community effort. The success of science, capital S, science over the past three centuries has enabled humans to reach a remarkable understanding of the natural world. And as we all know, this understanding makes our lives much more stable and predictable. A little cartoon just picks out one, uh, one, one uh, feature of what science has discovered. Without science, we wouldn't know that the future holds uh, bad things about if we continue to emit greenhouse ga gases. So this is all comes from our understanding of how the world works. So individuals, communities, and nations must all make wide, wise, long-range decisions based on what scientists do and do not know and therefore, um, everyone needs to understand the difference between science with the smallest, what some science may, scientists may say, and science with a capital S, which is the critical evidence-based process of getting from one to the other. Uh, if you don't understand that, then you don't respect science. And this is what's happening in my country. We have so many people who are not refusing to wear masks, for example. Uh, don't understand uh, that we know how the masks work and that they're critical for controlling the epidemic. And there are all these rumors on the internet that masks cause diseases. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff that's really killing tens of thousands of Americans. Uh, and so we now realize that the failure to understand how science works and appreciate and why you should listen to what scientists have uh, know through capital S science is, is critical for every society. And it's deeply discouraging in the United States today, many political leaders feel comfortable denying what science knows. This is true on issues that range from protecting us from the virus to climate change and many other issues, um, even vaccination. Uh, it, it's just incredible uh, and very, uh, very motivating, should be very motiv motiv motivating for scientists to, to, to devote more, much more attention to trying to make a difference by spreading science through their country and the world. I, I claim this is a, a sign of a general failure of both science education and science communication. So what about science education? I think a basic principle is that at all levels Teachers should make students struggle with a problem before they're told the answer. Uh, in fact, there's very good re education research showing that this is a powerful way to generate deeper learning. However, as, as we all know, it's much easier just to have uh, science taught as science facts that kids have to memorize in school and spit back the answers on some kind of test. And this is not science, it's not teaching science, it's not preparing our students to deal with the real world of virus epidemics and, and climate change and many other, many other is issues that science has wise uh, guidance for. So this is what <laughs> school science should look like. This is, uh, I had a project year, many years ago, how many years ago? Uh, 40 years ago, something like that, in San Francisco to teach kids science. This is taken, uh, this is taken from a classroom, a noisy classroom where kids are solving problems. 
The teacher is walking around <clears throat> the classroom like a coach. Uh, she's in the back there. I call that every child a scientist. <clears throat> in that program, here's what the official curriculum was in San Francisco, 1993. Yeah, at the right time of year, the first year of school, the five-year-olds put on clean white socks and walk around the schoolyard under trees. The, the, the idea, they're, they're, they come back to their classroom, take off the socks, and the socks are dirty. And each black speck, they take off a little forceps and put an, each black speck to their socks in a different numbered square on a piece of paper. And the problem is to figure out which are seeds and which are dirt. Of course, most of them are dirt, but some will be seeds because seeds have evolved to stick to animal fur. And so they start by examining each speck with a $3 plastic microscope and drawing what they see in each square. Then they have a class argument about, you know, discussion. How would they, you know, which ones might be seeds? And some uh, student suggests that maybe the round ones are seeds, you know, the ones that are regularly shaped. And then the teacher, if they're doing this right, doesn't say, you know, that's right. And the teacher says, well, what are the other students in the class think? And they finally come to agree that that's a possibility. Next day, they might spend the whole day discussing how you would test that possibility. You know, and some kid, some five-year-old will eventually suggest we could plant all the round ones in one pot and plant all the other ones that we don't think are seeds in another pot and see if we only get seeds, only get plants growing in the in, in one of the two pots. And they end up doing that experiment, testing their own idea, the five-year-old idea that the regularly shaped ones are seeds. So this shows that you could actually do science, even with the first year of school. This is called inquiry-based science education. So if you imagine an education that includes solving hundreds of such challenges over the course of 13 years of school, I believe that children prepared for life in this way would be great problem solvers in the workplace. They'd be able to have jobs. Uh, there'll be people who are able to make wide judgments for their family, their community, their nation. They won't believe that masks cause disease. They will believe that masks pre prevent you from disease. Uh, and there will be adults who reject what I call magical thinking. Uh, this uh, crazy idea that, that all, all these crazy ideas that are circulating on the internet through social media that people are much too susceptible to believing. So to remove a major barrier at the prog uh, of, uh, to progress at, at the early school level, the science education at the college level must change. Many of my friends don't like hearing this. <laughs> they need to stop just lecturing at children, uh, at students in college and telling them all the facts uh, because college sets the example for how all other uh, levels of, of society think of science education. Here's a, a classroom at the University of Minnesota that's been a pioneering. They teach all their uh, biology one, 3,000 students in, in groups of uh, 200 at a time. They teach all their 3,000 students taking biology one, an active learning biology class. And the, our academy did a major uh, study of of, of what we know from education research and publish this free um, book for uh, college professors called Reaching Students, What Research Says About Effective Stru Instruction in Undergraduate Science and Engineering. And this is a summary designed for uh, professors who want are willing to think about changing. Uh, thus far, uh, studies show that in the United States only about one-fifth of college courses are taught using active learning principles uh, like uh, research, the, like those that research shows are, uh, are uh, effective. And uh, so we have a long ways to go, but it used to be 1%. Now it's 1, 20% and we're, we need to change that to 100%. Uh, so I just wanna end by talking about four increasingly ambitious goals for science education to talk, to just to make it clear what I mean by redefining uh, what the term science education means. So, so one goal of science education, the standard one 
for, for a long time is to provide all adults with a general sense of what scientists have discovered about the world. You know, everybody should know about the vast expanse of the universe. They should all know that life is made of cells. They should know about the dangers of greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere and so on. Uh, and this is, this is important, but, but in general, this tends to be overemphasized and we teach too many facts and don't do enough uh, about any of the other goals of science education. The second goal, which is critical, I've emphasized, is to provide all adults with an ability to investigate scientific problems as scientists do using logic, experiment, and evidence. And this is a focus of this inquiry-based science education that's been emphasized for the last 30 years uh, or so, but only slowly um, being adopted. And then now, as we see what's happened in this pandemic, it becomes really critical to provide all adults with an understanding of how the scientific enterprise works and why they should therefore trust the consensus judgments of science on issues like smoking, vaccination, climate change, mask wearing, social distancing, and so on. So we need a much stronger focus of all education from college down to five-year-olds on this goal. And the question is how best to do this. And we need experiments and we need uh, a lot of energy put into this goal. It's urgent. And finally, the most ambitious goal would be to provide all adults with the habit of solving their everyday problems as scientists do using logic, experiment, and evidence. And this will require what's called transference from what is learned in science class to general habits of mind. We know that's difficult. And again, we need experiments of how best to do this. And this means science education is going to be much more important for all societies than most uh, societies have thought. So I just want to end by giving this uh, one example of what a new experiment looks like. This is a new project, the World Science Academies through the uh, Inner Academy Partnership, the IAP. It's led by the Smithsonian Science Education Center in Washington, DC. It's called the Science for Global Goals Project. And it focuses uh, on producing research guides for uh, children aged eight to 17, uh, students age uh, 8 to 17. Uh, and each one uses the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, uh, as a framework to focus uh, the, 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 the science on. And here, uh, these are all free on the internet. Uh, these three are already done. Uh, one on the virus, uh, how can I protect myself and others? One on food, how do we ensure good nutrition for all? And one on mosquitoes, how can we ensure health from, for all from mosquito-borne diseases? And this is, these are all active uh, learning exercises done in the community involving community volunteers, scientists, and others. And here's a, samples what students do in groups. They, this is uh, uh, based on the mosquito one. Uh, they map their community, uh, they determine where mosquitoes live in their community, and then they investigate how to control the mosquito population near their school, museum, or neighborhood. And, and these are students uh, in Panama, Panama and in Malawi, uh, where, where the uh, curriculum was first tested out and then revised. And <clears throat> so this changes the, the, the focus of science education to connect to real problems in the real world with students working in groups in their communities. Here's some, uh, the plan. New mod models are going to be on energy, water, cities, weather, so on. Uh, and again, it's going to take a huge uh, effort of the world scientific community to make these spread. They're being translated in many different languages. And this is an example of how we can start to get our, our uh, science and, and, and our um, definition of science education changed across the world by working together. This is the, the person to contact if you're interested, uh, Carol O'Donnell is the director of this whole project in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
I just uh, love this old slide. Uh, Edward Krieger was one of the 15 Academy presidents together uh, working in, uh, in a, I think it's the year 2000, and, and we went had a whole big meeting in Davos, Switzerland. On the way back to the airport, we stopped in the McDonald's. You could see that from the cups. Uh, uh, the, uh, your Academy president was was did not happen to be in this picture. We couldn't get everybody in the same picture. These are the presidents of the uh, Swedish, uh, Chinese, uh, <coughs> Indian, and Japanese science academies. The point I want to make is that scientists across the world have a, a share a common culture. We could work well together, irrespective of whether our governments agree or don't agree. We're all unhappy with our governments for not paying enough attention to what science knows about long-term consequences of current actions. And, and we need to be a much stronger force for spreading uh, that kind of uh, good <laughs> behavior and good politics around the world. Uh, uh, an important tool in this is uh, a new invention that was first uh, created in Germany called a Young Academy. Uh, they also sponsor what's so called a Global Young Ac uh, Academy. Uh, ba basically, to engage uh, outstanding young scientists and engineers that is age 35 to 40 uh, to work together in groups to uh, accomplish uh, important societal goals. And this is just a picture of the Scot Scottish Young Academy and the South, <laughs> South African Young Academy. Uh, there are now 40 nations with young academies. Uh, they're coordinated through the Global Young Academy, and they have an annual meeting of all these academies. And the most important thing about them, besides their energy, enthusiasm, and insights, is that they're all on social media. And the world exists on social media. So, as the students know, uh, the, the, the old professors like me <laughs> don't exist anymore. We have no social media presence. We don't even know how to use Facebook. Uh, so... Uh, it's critical now that the young academies actually uh, play a critical role in science communication and outreach. Uh, and uh, I'm very hopeful that the United States will soon be announcing their young academy. We, we've been very slow in getting going. We have a group called New Voices, which is, you know, you don't have to be called a young academy. You can be called anything, but our new, uh, we have a group of 18 uh, young scientists doing a beautiful job of trying to do science outreach in the United States. Uh, and we're, uh, hopefully our academies are going about to announce that this will be our permanent new young academy. Uh, so <clears throat> I just want to end with my favorite quote about scientific values and scientific temper. This is from a book by a physicist, Jacob Bronowski, called Science and Human Values. Bronowski flew over Hiroshima in 1945, right after the bomb went off, the atomic bomb, and he, he became very demoralized about the destructive effects of uh, scientific understanding on the world from the atomic weapon perspective. And he spent the next 10 years studying and reading and thinking about science. And he, he concluded, of course, that on balance, science is very good for the world. He pointed out that the society of scientists is simple because it has directing purpose to explore the truth. Nevertheless, it has to solve the problem of every society, which is to find the compromise between the individual and the group. It must encourage the single scientist to be independent and the body of scientists to be tolerant. This tolerance is very important uh, for all societies. Uh, so science has humanized our values, men and women, <laughs> have asked for freedom, justice, and respect, precisely as the scientific spirit has spread among them. So to create a scientific temper for the world, the challenges ahead for scientists are enormous. We need to mobilize and spend time outside of our labs. We need to encourage young scientists to be energetically involved in outreach. Uh, and by uh, working across the world together, we really must find a way to create a more rational and effective 
society. This is me <laughs> in Rio in 2012 signing textbooks. <laughs> but uh, I hope I'll be back again soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bruce, for this amazing and very inspiring presentation. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, <laughs> great, amazing. <laughs> so we have had like thousands of people watching you and like listening to your presentation over YouTube and also here on our room at Google Meet. And I'm hoping that you still have some time for some questions. I'm not sure how much in a hurry you are. Sure, of course. Okay, great, great. That's amazing. All right. So, um, as I mentioned, it was a very inspiring. We have a lot of young researchers and young researchers to be. So, a lot of the questions are coming from these people, and I think it will be important to uh, have them listening to their thoughts and to their questions. So, one of them um, was asking, in your opinion, what is the most emerging field in cell studies? Um, or more specifically, which fields of research in cell biology you are currently interested? And <laughs> if I may also ask, uh, what technologies you think will help us go to the next step? Which mm -hmm. are the new technologies that are emerging that you see as very promising? Well, that's a, that's a hard question because there's many, many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Myself. Right, right now, I'm trying to finish my uh, chapter on the nucleus, cell nucleus, and chromatin, and and uh, the effect of different forms of chromatin on how cells work, how chromosomes are organized. So uh, I think that's a fascinating field. Uh, but 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 in, in, for students to think about what's important, there's so many important mysteries that we don't know. There are two things to think about. One, you know, one is what's really exciting and what's important. And you know, so people would say, well, cancer research is important. So they jump into cancer research. But the other thing to think about mm -hmm. is, you know, what's not being explored very effectively where I could really make a contribution. So my disappointment is that so many young people just jump into very crowded fields. And if you're working in a very crowded field where many labs are doing the same thing, it's no fun to do science because you're always racing somebody else to be first. And second of all, uh, you're not going to make any unique contribution, most likely. You're just going to be part of a, you know, you're going to do the same kind of thing as other people have done, a little, maybe a little bit better, but hopefully, but. But, but to make a real contribution, you should try to find something that's not being explored with the kind of methods and, and, and talents that you have. And so, so I advise students after, you know, so, so you first get a graduate degree, you learn how to do science in one field. And that, this is very hard for students, but, but then I said, well, if you want to be a researcher, you're going to go do a postdoc postdoctoral study, why are you going to be a postdoc? Because you want to make yourself able to do things that other people can't do by combining what you know with what your postdoc advisor will teach you and you work there, and then you could really do something unique. And so that really puts pressure on students to think about what do I want to do after my postdoc? What's the problem I want to solve? And so that, 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 uh, is, is a great exercise if you can do it. I basically say, well, I know uh, genome, genomic technologies, for example, but I want to work on this parasite and uh, and do the, uh, and understand this problem. But then I need to know uh, the most advanced mic electron microscopy uh, technology. So I'll go to Elect a really good electron microscopy lab, and then I'll come out and I'm going to be a combination. Uh, I have a combination of skills to allow me to do things that other people are not doing. But 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 that's not what most students do. They, most students go on and work on the same kind of thing they did as, in their graduate studies because they know all those people and they want to work with a professor who you know does a good job on what they already know. But that's not really preparing them for the future in in the best possible way, because then they end up being like 
everybody else. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so uh, my, my main mission um, answer to that question is that there are many new technologies that are really fantastic and uh, make enabling us to do, do new things. But what I see repeatedly is people doing boring work using those <laughs> technologies because they just follow the next obvious thing to do. Uh, uh, I teach a course every year, uh, still teaching it, called Classical Papers in Biology. I co-teach it with a younger um, uh, woman and a uh, professor at, at UCSF. And uh, we talk a lot about how people design research strategy. And, and we, we, for example, uh, we talk about uh, Yamanaka's work on developing uh, new, uh, induced pure potent stem cells and, and, and how he designed a strategy to do something different from other people, uh, not, not to do what everybody else was doing uh, and uh, advertise a particular uh, 13 minutes of his talk about how he designed the strategy. Uh, if you think about doing that, you know, that, that kind of thing. What, what do I really want to know? And what skills I need to, to have, and then how do I invest in my future by getting new skills uh, that will enable me to do something really important? Very well thought, very well put. Thank you very much. So, on a different subject, um, and there are, have been several uh, questions that are somewhat related. And for example, Larissa, Larissa Delis was asking about. Um, open journals and mentioning about the cost of publications. Yeah. So um, I'll put them, the, those two different things together, but how do you see the movement for open journals and cost of publications and also for open data, for people making that data more open towards going yeah. into more visualization? Yeah, I think uh, preprint servers have been a great uh, movement. It's been really important in this pandemic to get papers out really quickly. Uh, <clears throat> But there, of course, that's not different. That we also need uh, peer review, and uh, <laughs> this is a long story. O- open access is, is an ideal solution to many uh, things, except that it's led to a lot of perversions. We have these pr- so-called predatory or fake journals now, uh, because uh, people can make money by charging. Uh, the scientists to publish in that those journals and uh, so science is being polluted by this uh, perversion of open access and so the really question is how to deal with it there's a major study that's just begun by the inter academy panel the same group that's involved in that uh, education project trying to see uh, mobilize the, the world uh, to in, in some world scientific community to counteract uh, fake journals and predatory journals and conferences uh, but so so we've ideally <laughs> open access would w- there be money somehow from a from the government or somewhere else to do the publishing and then then you'd have true open access journal uh, Eli, for example, has money from the, these foundations that are supporting open access. So, so that, that you could run the journal. It takes money to run a journal, to run the process. So you could run the journal by using money from an outside source and then you don't have to charge the authors. Now, charging the authors works okay if you have money, but then... It, then the open access journals have to have a system to allow people who don't have the kind of money to publish to publish. Otherwise, you're you're hurt. so it's not not a simple and it's a very controversial subject. How do you make journals work uh, to have the funds to be able to do the right kind of peer review uh, and still have open access? Uh, my own journal, PNES, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in 1996 or so, 1907, um, had a, uh, developed a system they still use, which is that our, our journal is immediately free to 139 countries, that is, countries of re- relatively low income, 
and we only charge, I think, uh, you know, United States, Europe, Australia, uh, Japan, I don't, you know, I, at any rate, uh, we, we get an income from those uh, countries, those libraries, but but everywhere else, like India, for example, is, is immediately free. I think it's immediately free in Brazil as well. Uh, and then everywhere else, it's immediately free after six months. So that's called open archive. But, you know, th that allows the, the journal to get enough income to run itself uh, without... Um, without having to charge the authors to very high fees. So, uh, you know, this is still a work in progress, but, 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 I, I'm, but, but the preprint servers also, of course, they're all open access, and those are very effective in, in getting research out quickly, and they've been a great uh, boon to the work done on the coronavirus, uh, very, um, very uh, clearly critical. Yeah, that's that's good. That's great. Uh, one more question in this somewhat around the same subject coming from Professor Marcelo Lamas. And he was mentioning and he was asking about not the cost to publish, but the cost to make research. I mean, there are so many new technologies and there are so many new things to do, but the costs are also getting more and more uh, demanding. Uh, uh, sometimes the gap between developed and undeveloped countries when we're talking about doing research is getting bigger. So what what do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, how do you view this thing where like things are getting more and more expensive uh, when you are talking about making research? That's a, a factor even within countries. For example, uh, you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York and Boston you have all the facilities and you go to the, you know, the University of Kansas or University of Oklahoma, they don't have the resources to have the same facilities. And so um, we have to have a much more collaboration and much more coordinate, uh, you know, sharing. No, no one lab could have all the technologies that you need for most research. So, you know, at a minimum, <laughs> what's become very important at a, Every, every major site, the Rio de Janeiro should be able to do this really well. You set up a, a, a series of core facilities that are shared. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a light microscopy facility, you have an electron microscopy facility, you have a, you know, a sequencing facility, you have, you know, tissue culture facility. You, I, I think you know, the list, you know, most places would come up with like 15 different shared facilities, something like that. And then they're open to everybody in Rio de Janeiro. It's not that, that you know, what I see happening is, um, I've been an advisor in India, for example, in Bangalore. Every, every, every institution wants their own genome facility, you know, their own sequencing facility. This is, this is nuts because it's too expensive. Uh, they should be sharing across the city of Bangalore, for example. Uh, and I don't know what the situation is real, but we need more cooperative science. We need the institutions need to work together to set up uh, these very expensive facilities that are shared. And that means when you go use them, you contribute your research grant funds to help them be maintained. But the huge cost of, for example, uh, you know, cryo-electron microscopy, I mean, just, just the service contract on the microscope was over a million dollars a year or something like that. So, so it's critical that we have more collaborative sharing, and this is an important feature of leadership in universities these days. Interesting. Very good. Uh, so if I may, moving a little bit more into science and society, we have a lot of people are uh, making some kind of comments about this science denial movement that we have in Brazil, also in other places around the world. And I wonder what's your current view on how to fight that? How do you discuss with the society and also with politicians on how to fight this science denial movement? And what's the, in your view, the whole of education on that? How can we use education for like young children and 
uh, teenagers to uh, fight that? Well, uh, you know, over the long term, we have to change science education. So starting every year of school, you actually learn what science is and how to think like a scientist. That's what uh, my major, but that's going to take a long time. Immediately, you know, I think we, young scientists, uh, uh, grad, starting in undergraduate students can do this. They need to think about how to use social media effectively to counteract all these crazy ideas about the virus. That's a great example. Now, 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 now the good thing about uh, science is that, you know, you, you can't make the virus go away by um, politi political statements like our president, President Trump is, you know, says magically, I am sure that the, he said the, the virus will go away after the election, you know, things like this, you know, that won't work. <laughs> so the good news is that these um, crazy statements are going to be disproved. But we need to do a much better job of counteracting uh, and, and uh, helping people understand what's good for their own health. And it's a great opportunity for science. And so, uh, for example, uh, our our young academy, uh, the the new voices. I th I think this is a great project for them. I, I don't understand how to use social media. <laughs> we need experiments. How do we how do we use social media to actually get inside these isolated silos of of magical thinking? You know, ma magical thinking of you know so many people in the United States say, well even when there's a vaccine, I'm not gonna get it. I mean what what the, what what is this about? <laughs> they, they don't understand. So so we need to, to have young people who know how to, to use uh, social media and and uh, to, we need to ha have experiments and what kind of, and this is the virus provides a great opportunity now. Let's, let's do some experiments. What kind of uh, internet connections, uh, you know, is it that in every community uh, we, sh we need to have local people uh, saying, you know, I'm from wherever it is in uh, some city in the Midwest of the United States or uh, the South that, where nobody wants to wear a mask and, and and have some of the young people there say, I'm from your community and here's why you need to listen to the science and but how to do this. I, I just, you know, what we do know from studies of the internet is that we, there, the groups that have these uh, crazy magical ideas about how the virus is going to be, uh, you know, it's a hoax. It's it's created by Tony Fauci. I mean, they have all these created by some. It's just all these crazy ideas that they're talking to each other, and nobody else gets. You know, when we they're not connected to the people uh, to other people with different opinions. So, so this is the problem that young people need to work on solving. Because I I I certainly know how to solve it. Yeah, uh, yeah. On that, for example, Professor Masatia was mentioning that there is right now this overexposure of research and researchers on the media because of the pandemic, and, and she was wondering if they, this can be a good or a bad thing. And I guess you have been commenting. You just commented a, a little bit about that, so uh, I guess maybe yeah. we can move on. But I wonder also, do you think? And some people were mentioning about education, so maybe you see on that subject. Do you think that? Uh, perhaps the way we have been teaching science to uh, to kids in fundamental and high school and middle school, uh, do you think we have we have we been doing something wrong? Do you think that there is anything specific we should try to change? Yes, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. Know, about... I, I don't know about Brazil, <laughs> but but anyway, I'm talking about the United States. You know what we not so different. <laughs> what we do is we, we we teach what's easiest. You know we have exams about facts of science. Yeah. You know and you know like the California science standards, uh, which, which were terrible, said every twelve year old should know about the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and you, know, you know another forty parts of the cell. Right. Well, you know the textbooks that they produced for the kids to learn uh, biology were the hardest books I've ever seen because 
there, there are like 500 bold-faced words like endoplasmic reticulum, and they were supposed to know what each of those words meant, but they couldn't understand any of it. So, so for, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, they memorized two sentences, and they put it back on an exam, and they get an A. Well, you know, what is, is that science? It, it makes you hate science. <laughs> so I think many of our politicians in the United States for denying climate change and even uh, don't want vaccination. Uh, they, they probably had this horrible experience in school about science and their whole image of science is negative, right? It's a horrible, it's some kind of dogma that somebody tried to teach me like, you know, some kind of magical, you know, you know, arrogant people telling me what I should think about something. So we have to change that completely. Uh, is that, you know, and it needs to be, you know, if you're trying to deal in schools with issues like, um, you know, how to prevent mosquitoes from causing dengue in my community, and, and you have that taught well, you, you, you know, science becomes rel relevant and kids learn how to think using logic and evidence rather than magically. So, 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 you know, this is a huge issue and it's only going to change if scientists lead the way. First of all, we teach college classes. So if, we, if our college biology one class is like that other course, you know, learn all the facts and spit them back on exams about the cell, every fact, and not understand anything about how science works or how it was discovered and you know, then, then we're failing to uh, prepare citizens for real life. I see. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I made my own one last question, because we have been give, you have just gave us such an inspiring uh, talk. So maybe if we could end on a high note or like something uh, more uh, optimistic. So Jordana was asking a very interesting question. Maybe you could use that just to wrap up. And she was asking, uh, I mean, could you give any advice for young scientists? And more specifically, if you knew, already knew what you wanted to work and uh, research with before you started doing your own like early career uh, research. So maybe if we could end up with like this more uh, personal commentary, that would be great. And I would already <laughs> like to thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you've done a very good job of being the, the master of ceremonies here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have a future on television. <laughs> Let's see, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> well, in my case, I was a pre -med. You know, I, I went to high school. I really enjoyed high school chemistry. I had a very good chemistry teacher. I went to uh, back to school night where they were talking about careers, and I wanted to know where could I use chemistry. And there were there's two talks that were relevant. One was a chemical engineer, and he gave a very boring talk about you know big pipes and making all kinds of chemicals and stuff. And then another was a doctor, and uh, he talked about how science was important for medicine. So I decided I'd become an MD, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. So I went to, in the United States. You go to college, and you have to take you know, four years of pre medical courses which meant I took all this science. I had to take organic chemistry, physics, and, and biology. And uh, then I got very bored by the laboratories that we had in college. I went to Harvard College, and I was in the laboratory three or four afternoons every week doing uh, what I would call cooking, following instructions. I was measuring things and following. It was nothing to do with science learning how to use science and the equipment, you know, how to use a still. And it was incredibly boring. And finally, after th in the third year of this, I, I said, I can't stand this anymore. <laughs> how could I continue to take this course? It was a physical chemistry course, but not get, have to take this horrible lab. And they told me that I could work in a research lab. And they never told me that before. So I I I did I skipped the physical le chemistry laboratory second semester and I worked in the research lab of a famous uh, professor Paul Doty, and then the next summer he asked me to spend the whole summer working in the lab, and after that summer uh, I decided I was not going to go to medical school. I finally found out what science was, 
I didn't find out what science was from any of the courses I took. It was only from working in the lab. So uh, I would recommend that all undergraduate students uh, have some ex laboratory experience. And, and that we now try to get students, you know, the first or second year in college to be associated with a laboratory and spend four hours a week or so in the laboratory and hopefully then work over the summer. But um, there's only one way to find out whether you should be a scientist or not, is actually try to do some <laughs> science. And you try to do two things. Do I like this? Do I enjoy doing this? That's the first thing. And secondly, uh, do I think I'm reasonably good at it? Because, you know, you only want to do things that you think you have some talent for. Otherwise, I mean, uh, you know, you have to find your, your life course in a way that, you know, be able to solve some problems effectively. And solve, and it's wonderful having a life that you could devote to solving problems. Uh, and uh, if you're solving problems in science, you want to know that you enjoy it and that you're relatively good at it. You know, you have some talent. So those are, you could only find out by doing it. So uh, I, I would encourage everybody to, 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 to think that way. Hands on experience, that's, that's a must for certain. Okay, Professor, um, I was here in 2012 as a grad student when I saw your presentation, when you were here in Rio. Now he, I'm here like, uh, as I just, uh, I'm just studying here my profession, my, my, my research here as a professor in the Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, and uh, also on behalf of uh, our grad school program, I would very much like to thank you for your time I know you are extremely busy, so we mm -hmm. really, really do appreciate uh, well, the two hours you just gave us. Oh, well, thank you. We'll be, been waiting to, we'll be waiting to to see you back in Rio. Uh, in yes, the I can. <laughs> Look forward to it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank bye you bye. all. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. Obrigada, pessoal. Acho que foi ótimo. Acho que foi muito bom. Obrigada, Fábio, Suzana.